Okay, Deuteronomy 32, if you will. Deuteronomy 32, and uh, we'll get started this evening. Deuteronomy 32. Um, last time we got down through the fifth stanza, down to verse 33. I want to, this evening, kind of take a rabbit trail off, and then next week we'll finish six, because I got to thinking about uh, verse 31, 32, and 33. So let's read in verse 31 here. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is a vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and their cruel venom of asp. And I know last time we looked at, uh, back in Revelation 14 and again in Psalm 16 of the drink offerings and everything, but you'll notice now in verse 34, the sixth stanza starts, and he says, Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? All, that this is, all that's been going on with Israel, they've gone off into this false religion, verse 31, 32, 33, and 30, okay? I'm storing it up because I'm going to get them. And I'm, I, I'm treasuring it up. I'm storing it up for the judgment. So he says in verse 35, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. The day of calamity is the day of the Lord. So we just moved in Israel's history to the timing of the judges and this infiltration of the false uh, religion all the way out to the second coming, <laughs> to the day of judgment. So prophetically, that's where we're headed in the sixth stanza. Now we're going to go through the details of these next time. Verse 37, I'm sorry, verse 36, For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants. And when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left, and he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted? which did eat the fat of their sacrifice and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. Boy, he, he, right in the middle of all of this judgment, he says, by the way, the judgment is to right the wrongs that Israel has done, to make them right again, to purify them, to clean them up. They are his people. They will be his priests and so forth. And so we've got to get them cleaned up. But then verse 37, where are your gods at? Where are they at? <laughs> where are they? You guys, you guys fell into their system. You go let them take care of you. You let them go protect you. And literally, in, in, the last, in the 70th week of Daniel, in the back half of that time, the nation of Israel, not the little flock, but the apostate nation of Israel, will literally run to the Antichrist and say, protect us, help us. And the little flock is already gone. They're off in the wilderness and hiding and, and being protected and so forth in that manner. But when this happens here, the, that's what's going on. So in verse 38, when he says, "...which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drink the wine of their drink offerings," literally their gods eat this stuff and do this. So all of this comes about in Israel's history from back up in verse 31 and following. Verse 31, for their rock is not as our rock. So their rock, little r, is not as our rock, big r. Our foundation, their foundation is all in, in an uproar. It's all messed up. Their vine is a vine of Sodom in the fields of Gomorrah. In Revelation, he says that the city of Jerusalem is as Sodom and Gomorrah. So, I mean, they've messed up big time here. And it's because they've gone after the wrong foundation. Now, we're all, in, in, by the way, in Scripture, all of the, the, the religious system that we're going to be looking at now, just, again, to kind of a rabbit trail before we get into the judgment, is called Baal worship. And it starts in Genesis 10 and goes all the way to the, to the book of Revelation. Go to Revelation 17 with me. That's... Um, where we're going to start, and I believe the handout should be started there too. Okay. So I'm going to get a handout so I have it. 
but these are online for the folks watching the YouTube. You just got to go find, search under Understanding Israel, and there it is, okay? Revelation 17, 1. This passage is about the beast that the woman is riding. Verse 1, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me and saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit to the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast full of names and blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So again, we're talking about the beast that's the, that the woman's going to ride. Note, and, and just notice some things, seven heads and ten horns. Um, verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet cover, color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, and upon her forehead was, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, an abomination of the earth. Now, that's an interesting title because she's called Mystery Babylon the Great, but she's called the mother of harlots. She's the source of all of this idolatry, all of this pagan religion that's coming out here. Okay? Verse 9 and, and, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So we've got something interesting here. We've got a woman, okay? She, we we're just talking about that, weren't we? We got a woman. She, uh, verse number 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings. We've got a woman. She's associated with the city. She has uh, purple and scarlet are her colors. And she's got a symbol, that golden cup. Okay? So we've, and, and she's got a title called Mystery Babylon the Great. So when he talks about Mystery Babylon, come back to Genesis 10. Where does Babylon get its start? Well, it starts in Genesis 10 and 11 with Nimrod, okay? My chalk is running short, so it's a little scribble up there. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty hunter, mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Um, the foundation of Babylon starts right here with Nimrod. Now, Nimrod, being a mighty hunter before the Lord, is not a good thing. First of all, Noah is told in the previous chapter that you're, you're to go out now and hunt the animals. That mechanism and that change in, in that is an issue of getting man to spread out and to fill up the earth. Well, look at verse number, you're in chapter 10. Look at verse number 10. And the beginning of his what? Kingdom. In order for me to build a kingdom and a city, in chapter 11 is where it starts, a city and a tower, what do I have to have around me? I got to have people. So guess what I'm going to do? I will go and hunt for you and put it in the grocery store and you can just come and come and be, I'm going to provide for you. But the verse says he's a mighty hunter before the Lord, which is basically, he's just doing it in spite of the Lord. The Lord's watching him do this. It's out of rebellion. And, it, and it's really out of an issue of, of the depth of sin. Um, if you come over, well, it, it, it starts in chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, it, it's interesting in the first 12 ver chapters of Genesis, not everything is in a chronological order. Chapter 1 happens, and then 2 kind of comes in and fills in some things that happened in chapter 1. 
then three happens, and then four happens, and you know now we get a little order till nine. Well, then ten, you have the divisions of the nations, but really ten happens as a result of chapter 11. <laughs> and while all that's going on, really chapter 12 is happening with Abraham and, and telling him to get out of the land and you're, the, you're my guy. So you kind of got this stacking thing that happens here. Uh, in chapter 11, verse 1, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go, let us make brick and burn them thr throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. It, it starts right here. They go in and they make brick and they make their own stuff is what they're doing. They're not out using the stones and so forth from the, the creation, they're over here making their own brick, and they make slime. <laughs> they don't... When Noah built the ark, what did he have for the pitch? Do you remember? The, he had the gopher wood, and he had a pitch that he made. All of that was from the natural resources. Slime here, that's mud. But what it represents is it represents their human effort, the brick and the slime. It's their human effort. They're going to build a city and a tower, the city, the political entity, the tower, the religious center. And where are we headed? We're trying to reach it to God, don't, aren't we? We're trying to reach to heaven. Now notice the end of verse 4. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. I, I, again, he's a mighty hunter before who? The Lord. What did the Lord tell him to do? Scatter, hunt. He says, no, don't do that. Let's do this together. It's called internationalism. That's the satanic uh, of, of, uh, response to the issue of nationalism. Verse 9, therefore, now we know what happened. The Lord saw it, came down, confounded the, the languages, scattered them abroad. Verse 9, therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And then you have the events in chapter 10 happen where everybody is set up. Uh, real quick, come over to Romans 1 that, and verse number 32. That issue about doing this stuff before the Lord, doing it our way. Um, verse 32, which is at the end of, of the great section here about pagans, heathens, and just flat out sinful men. He says, who knowing the judgment of God. Did Nimrod know the judgment of God? Sure he did. He knew what was coming. He knew who God was. He knew the whole deal. Knowing the judgment of God, which they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Even though they know that what they're doing is against the word of God, they're still doing what? They're still doing it. Mighty before the Lord. So, the kingdom of Babel, of Babylon, starts here with Nimrod back in Genesis 10 now, okay? And they, they're going to build a city. By the way, what did Cain do in Genesis 4? He kills Abel. What, did, what kind of sacrifice did Cain bring? Of his own labor, okay? The Lord didn't accept it. Cain goes out, kills Abel. Cain's marked with, as a vagabond. And the, instead of wandering, what does he do? He builds a city, names it en uh, named it Enoch after his boy, Enoch. Okay, well, what did Nimrod do? What did God say? Get out there and scatter. Nimrod says, we can do it better. We'll just do it this way. We'll do it my way. So they're going to build this tower and the city, the political. So this is a religious system that has a political bent to it. All right? And it's established right here so that it, and again, their goal, verse 4, is to get to heaven. We can get up there on our own. We can do this our own. That's why, that's where the steeple issue comes from when you see steeples. Um, I think they're kind of cool, the bell tower type, you know, but what is that? It's, we can get up there on our own. Now, again, uh, come over to Judges. This is where all this starts. Judges 17. What happens in Scripture 
It's called Baal worship. B-A-A-L and then Baal worship. And in Judges 17, now what that system does is it grabs on to the pagans, to the Gentiles, and it begins to consume the Gentiles. The nation that then God goes and separates out Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the twelve, it doesn't consume into those guys. It doesn't get into them until you come to the judges. Because what has happened historically? You have, I don't want to mess up my, because I'm going to do, you've had Moses come. Can you see that? You've had Moses and the Exodus, right? They go out into the wilderness, which is where we're at in Deuteronomy 32. Who's, who comes on the scene after the wilderness? Joshua comes on the scene, right? And they go into what? They go into the land, don't they? Remember our study in Leviticus 26 and those five courses. We've had, we're, we're, we're in the course one, and we're about to go into course two. In the land, Judges is where Judges shows up. Joshua is dead now. If you, you're in, did you get Judges 17? Just flip back. Um, flip over. Well, no, you're in 7. Now, nah, let's do that. Flip to the end of Judges. Judges 21-25. Judges 21-25. Here's the theme of the Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. What does that mean? There was no Moses. There's no Joshua. There's nobody there to keep them on the, the, the right track. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, every time in, in the book of the Judges, and, and in our future studies, we're going to go through the Old Testament, the history of it, and so forth. But in the, in the Judges, the, he would raise the judge up, chapter 2. The Israel, get them corrected, Israel would go. The judge would die. Israel would go over, get, get all corrupted again. They would start their whining. And then he would raise, them, raise up a judge. They would get right, repent, do all that. The judge would die. They would go all back into apostasy, all, worse than before. And it just became a vicious cycle. Okay, Judges 17 is where Baal worship is introduced into the nation of Israel, okay? And it's introduced into Israel here through a guy named Micah. Now, he's, this isn't the prophet Micah. This is just a guy named Micah, verse 5. And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Now, notice what we have. We have a house of gods, small g, we have a what? What do we have? We got a priest, right? We have an ephod and a teraphim, so we got some worship aids, right? Verse 6, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We've got a, we've got a house of gods, we've got idols, if you look back up there at verse number 3, his mom is the main supporter of it. Verse 3, And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord for my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now therefore I will restore it unto thee. And he restores it. So, by the way, who financed the deal? Mom financed the deal. The woman financed the deal, okay? Don't hit him, it's okay. But notice the issue, graven images, graven, the carvings, the, their little images that they carve, but molten is that issue of metallurgy. I get it, metallurgy, where they go in and they, and they, they, they like the, the statutes and stuff like that, they get into it even more elaborate. He, Micah's dad is not on the scene at all, at least not in Scripture, okay? 
verse 7. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. Now we got some, something's going to happen here. And the man departed out of the city of Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place, and he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. Now notice something. He's a Levite, so he's the real deal, isn't he? Now, he just told his sons to be the priest, didn't he? But now we just, we got the true, now, sorry guys, you're out because we're going to hire us a Levite. And he's going to be our priest. Verse 9, and Micah said unto him, by the way, he's from Ephraim. He's up in Ephraim. He's up north. Okay? When you see, and we read, in, like in our study in Luke, and, we, and he goes over there into Dan, and he's up north. That's Samaria is where we're going to see Samaria show up here in a minute. When he talks about in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, that's what we're talking about. Okay, we're talking about Satan's got a stronghold, a stronghold up north. And uh, this Levite, he's looking for a job, isn't he? Verse 9, And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to, to, sojourn, to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me and be unto me a what? A father... And a priest. Okay? Now, we're going to look at that in just a second here. But a father and a priest. And I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year. So you know what he just took? He just took a vow of poverty. You hear about that with these guys. Okay? And thy victual so the levite went in the levite said hey this is my first paying gig i'm in man three shots oh yeah and you're gonna feed me room and board and you're gonna clothe me <laughs> we're good but wh where is he where is this levite going into he's going into a house of idolatry isn't he so he should know better don't you think he's just getting out of seminary down there out of Bethlehem, Judah, he, he's hot and ready to go. He's eager beaver. He should know better, shouldn't he? Unless what's been going on down there in Bethlehem, Judah? <laughs> you, just apostasy. You just go up there and find you a place and don't rock the boat. Verse 11, And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. Notice that. Now, he's going to... You see in verse 10, be unto me a father and a priest. Come over to Matthew 23. If this verse isn't written down by this, you need to write this verse down. Matthew 23. It's really verse 9, but we're going to read up to it, okay? Verse 9, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. That's the conclusion, but I want to start back up in verse 5. Because the issue here of what's going on now we've moved. We're not back in Judges. Now where are we? We're in earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 3. Matthew 25, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 23, verse 5. Well, shoot, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribe and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Why? Why would he say that? Because they're in, they're under the law, and Moses is that they're in they're in charge. But do not ye their, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. <laughs> but all their works they do, for to be seen of men, they make broad their what. The, their phylacter, well, I'm not going to spell that out, so they're okay. Now, the phylacter, by the way, is, is a band that goes around the arm, and it's designed to hold the scriptures. But notice what these guys have done. They've broadened them. They've made them beggar. Look how important we are. Have you ever noticed at a graduation for a college and the guy's got stripes on their arms? That's where it comes from. Because it's the degrees, it's, it's the level of education they've been through at that in, each institution has its own set, you know, bachelors, masters, PhD, doctorate, idiot. 
Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Science. You know, okay. So it depends on what it is, but that's what that is. So it's a mat. They broaden their philanthropies. Keep reading. They've enlarged the bo borders of their what? Their garments. Interesting. They got a garment. We're going to see that in just a minute. And greetings in the, uh, they love the uppermost seats of the feast, the chief seats in the synagogues, and the greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all, you, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father. The reason he says that, and he's not talking about talking about your dad, your biological father, is because father is a religious title that's associated with this stuff here, which is associated with that woman riding the beast, which is associated with the satanic policy of evil. It's associated with that false religious system of, that they, uh, uh, of Baal worship. Okay? Now, you got Matthew. Hold on to that real quick, because back in Judges 17, verse 5, he's got an ephod and a teraphim. Now, a teraphim is a statue that you carry around with you, according to the handbook, all right? It's a little statue you carry around. But an ephod is, is a long robe. It's a night shirt. You're, come over to Mark, chapter 12, and then run back to first, uh, 2 Kings, 2 Kings 10. Remember, we just read a minute ago about their garments. They got garments. 2 Kings 10 and Mark 12. 2 Kings 10 and Mark 12. We got a garment down here. 2 Kings 10, verse 19. Now, therefore... Now, by the way, this is Jehu. Now, Jehu's a good guy. He, 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 he's going to wipe out Baal. 2 Kings 10, verse 19. Okay? Jehu is, he, he, he's a good guy. Um, verse number 19. Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal and all his servants and, and, his pre, and all his priests. Let none be wa wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live, but Jehu did it in subtility to the intent that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal, and they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through, through all Israel, and all the worshipers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to another. We're going to have a big meeting. We're going to use the convention hall down there, and you get them all here. You pay their way get into the state treasury and pay their way. I want them all here. Verse 22, And he said unto him that was over the vestry, bring forth what? Vestments. Now the garments have a name. They're called vestments. The entryway back there is called the vestibule. It's where you hang your garment when you come in from the street. Okay, we call it the foyer or the front door. <laughs> But that's what it is, okay? The, for all the worshipers of Baal, and he brought them forth vestments. And the end of the story here really with them is that he kills them all, okay? Now run to, to Mark 12. Now Mark 12 is the corresponding passage to Matthew 23 that we just read. Mark 12, 38. And he said unto them in his, do in his doctrine, Beware the scribes which love to go in what? Long clothing. They got a bunch of robes that they call vestments. Okay? When you see this, what do you see? You see a guy that's called a priest and he's called a father. He's on a vow of poverty and he's got a bunch of religious symbols around him that he's using. So when you see that, you're seeing the same... Now, come back to Judges. You're seeing the same thing that the Bible says is Baal worship, and you're not to mess with. You're to stay out of it. 
problem is, is that Micah here in Judges 17, he's bringing it into the nation. He's establishing it. Now, the Gentile, now just think about this. Joshua, this, they go into the land. What was the edict given by Moses to when you go into the land? You clean them out. You don't take any of them. What did Joshua do? Joshua did that. But when he dies, the next generation said, no, we're going to take what we like. We're going to keep the best, and we'll get rid of the worst. What did they keep? Where do you think Micah got the idea of a house of God? We're in Judges 17. We're, we're down a few judges here, okay? Samson has just died in chapter 16. What did Micah see? Micah has seen this coming in, hasn't he? As they go in and they're invading and they're dealing with the different, tri the different, na the different ites that are in the land still. So what does he do? Hey, I like that, so I'm going to have a priest and so forth, okay? And I'm going to call him father. He'll take a vow of poverty. We'll get him dressed up so he is noticeably different from everybody else. So, again, when you see this stuff, it's corrupting, it's corrupting Israel in Scripture, but it's also corrupting the body of Christ, and it's all Baal worship. <clears throat> it's all the satanic policy to go against what God's doing. Okay? Chapter 18, trouble shows up. Verse 1, In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. Now, which is interesting because what happened to Dan? They've been excommunicated. They're a tribe back in the, in the millennial kingdom. They will be established back up as, as a tribe. But they're, they, they don't have anything right here. They're looking. Verse 3, When they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite. And they turned in hither, thither, and said unto him, Who brought thee thither, and what makest thou in this place, and what hast thou here? And he said unto them, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. Now that's loaded. Because the Danites show up, and they're going to take Micah's stuff is what they're going to do the rest of the chapter. But they look at the priest and say, Hey, did, did he call you? How'd you get here? And oh, by the way, how much is he paying you? So Micah, sa the priest says, well, I have a vow of poverty. I ain't making anything. <laughs> right? That's what he says. Micah 3, by the way, he says that, that these guys are hirelings. John 10, he talks about them being out there for hire. Filthy lucre's sake, Paul calls it. Verse 5. And they said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee, of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. Please, let's pray. Look for the prosperous way. When you hear people talk about praying that we have a prosperous journey, here's where some of that's coming from. Okay? And the priest said unto them, What? Go in peace. What do the priests say today when you deal with them? Go in peace. This morning we were talking and I said, my daddy beats your daddy in dominoes, you know. <laughs> that's, you know, that's about the end of it, you know. But when you think about what they're doing, here it is. Before the Lord is your way, wherein ye go. Now, the, they're going to go. By the way, verse 7, Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt care, care, careless after the manner of the Zidonians. Remember the Zidonians. They're going to show up here in a little bit. So they go in, they, verse 9, and they said, Arise, that we may go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is, a very, is very good, and are ye still. Be not slothful to go and to enter to possess the land. When ye go, ye shall come under, unto a people secure. And to a large land, for God hath given it into your hands a place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. And there went from thence a family of the Danites out of Zorah and out of Esterol, 600 men appointed with weapons of war. So what they did was they went in, they saw the land where the Zidonians, and they said, okay, this is where we want. We like this place. 
So they go to war, verse, 11, verse 12, and they went up and they pitched there and so forth. They, they win, verse 13, and they possessed thence unto Mount Ephraim. Or they passed thence unto Mount Ephraim and came unto the house of Micah. So they show up, they look at the priest, they say, hey man, how, how'd you get here? He tells them the story, thus and thus. They said, oh, by the way, how much is he paying you? Because he said, the priest says, I, I'm, he hired me to be his priest. So they look at him and say, okay, how much? So, and he says, okay, would you do us a favor? Since you're a Levite, you're a man of God, pray and ask and see if we're going to prosper in our journey over here to find us a land. Priest prays, says, go in peace. You're going to win. No problem. Now these guys are on their way back. to get. They've won the victory. Now they're going back to get the, 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 the tribe. They pass by Micah's place. Then answered the five men that went to spy out the country of Laish, and said unto their brethren, Do ye know that there is in this house an ephod, and a teraphim, and a graven image, and a molten image? Do you guys know that there's a house of God over here? Now watch what they say. Now therefore consider what ye have to do. And they turned thitherward and came to the house of the young man the Levite even unto the house of Micah and saluted them and the 600 men appointed with the weapons of war stood by uh, uh, which were the children of Dan stood by the entering of the gate now what did they just do the five guys went in and said all right guys we found us a house with the priest with all the religious stuff we need done what do you guys think we should do well what they say take him and we'll stand guard at the front door. So what'd they just do? Politically, they just moved in, didn't they? The guy with the gun usually wins. Okay? The 600 men are standing there. Verse 17. The five men that went to spy out the land went up and came in thither and took the graven image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with the weapons of war. And these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved images, the ephod, the teraphim, and the molten image. Then said the priest unto them, What do ye? Now, think about this. They're already ransacked the place, and the priest goes, What are you doing? Oh, please, don't hurt me. Don't, what are you doing? Now, watch what happens here. And they said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thy hand upon thy mouth, and go with us, and be to us a what? A father and a priest. Now, watch this. It, watch this question. Is it better for thee to be a priest under the house of just one man? Or is it better to run the tribe? Or that thou be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel? See how it got into them? Now it's in. It's not just in one man's house. Now it's in a tribe. And that tribe is the tribe of Dan. Now watch the priest. And the priest's heart was glad. And he, re and he said, no, thank you. <laughs> Baloney. He took the ephod and the teraphim, the graven, and went in the midst of the people. The dude helped them move. He goes, yeah, sure. Why? He just went from a vow of poverty to big time. He's the head guy. He's the big guy here. He's a little happy, isn't he? Now, and the priest's heart was glad, verse 20. <laughs> verse 21. So they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle and the carriage before them. And when they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house, which gathered together, overtook the children of Dan. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces and said unto Micah, What aileth thee that thou comest with such a company? What's your problem? What's wrong, man? What's, what's, wh wh why did you come up against us like this, man? Don't you know we just won the battle and we got 600 men? We're ready to go to war. And you're running up here like you own the place. What's going on? And I watch Micah. And he said, Ye have taken away my gods which I made, and the priest... And you are gone away, and what have I more? You took all my stuff. I got nothing left. And what is this that ye say unto me? What aileth thee? What's ailing him? He took all, he took, they took his religion. It's gone. 
this is when Baal worship gets into the nation of Israel, is right here. Now, by the way, you keep reading there, verse 26, 25, And the children of Dan said unto him, Let not thy voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon thee. You better keep your mouth shut or we're going to kill you. And the children of Dan went their way, verse 26, and when Micah saw that, that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back unto his house. He went home to mom. And they took the things which Micah had made and the priests which he had and came unto Laish unto a people that were at quiet and secure, and they smote them with the edge of the sword and they burnt the city with fire. You know what they did? They came in with the political power, but they also came in with the religious power. And they came in under the trumpets blowing of, of, look at this, we are taking this land back for God and for country. That's what they're doing. Same thing that the crusaders claimed, same thing that everyone has ever been in a religious battle. We're doing this because the word of God says, and there's our priest, and he's got the word. Verse 29, and they came, and they called the name of the city Dan. Verse 30, and the children of Dan set up the graven image. And Jonathan, the, the son of Gershom, and the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Did you see how long that went? That goes from this time all the way out in their history. Now you see Jonathan there. Jonathan, he's the son of Gershom and, he's the, and, and the son of Manasseh. Um, this, he's really the son of Moses. When you go and trace jo Jonathan back and you find Gershom, Gershom comes right from Moses. I know it says Manassas, and, and I, I, for the life of me, I can't remember what Manassas means, but it's some, it's, anyway, it is what it is. Two generations from Moses, apostasy is established into the nation that he brought out of Egypt. That's how quickly this took off. It's how quickly it took on. Now, go run over with me to Genesis 49. Because the tribe of Dan, we're not going to study this guy, but there's an interesting thing. A lot of times people don't say that there's prophecy in Genesis. And Genesis is full of it. Genesis 49, Jacob is making some prophetic uh, things about his boys. Uh, Genesis 49, verse 16. Dan... So he's going to talk about Dan now. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a what? Who's that? There's Satan. Now keep reading. By the way, an adder in the path that biteth the, the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backwards. What was the curse of Satan in Genesis 3? You remember? He was going to be a serpent, but he was going to bruise the heel that's going to crush it. What's Dan doing? He's biting at the heel. And what's he, see that? He's a picture of who? Of, of the satanic, of Satan. But he's also where the Antichrist, he's the tribe of the Antichrist. The Antichrist comes out of the tribe connected with Dan. The lineage, okay? So that's where he's coming from. So Dan becomes a very interesting tribe to study through. And we're not going to do it. I, you can do it. Because that's why. Because Dan is where Baal worship got into the kingdom. They got into the nation, okay? Now go back to Judges 18. Did I finish 18? Um, yeah, go over to 1 Kings. Let's just go back there. 1 Kings 16. Dan, Dan is a tribe in the north, and it's where... Uh, 1 Kings 16, that's where we're headed. It's where Satan gets his stronghold. When you talk about... When you read scriptures about Satan getting his stronghold and, and, and where his seat of power is, it's all in the north. It's all... And nothing good come out of the north. <laughs> the south will rise again, right? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> the, uh, the, the issue of the north here, okay? 
1 Kings 16, verse number 23, is where you have Elijah now on the scene. Six, uh, 1 Kings 16 and verse 23. Here, this is before Elijah, here is where it's in Dan, but now it's going to take the whole nation of Israel is here. You have Omri, verse 23. In the thirty and first year of Asa, king of who? Judah. Judah. Began Omri to reign over who? Okay, so Judah is the south, the southern tribe. Israel are the northern ten tribes. Okay? That's how you tell these guys apart. It's because it's Judah and Israel all the way through. And he, he bought, verse 24, and he bought the hill... Samaria of Shimmer for two talents of silver and built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shimmer, owner of the hill Samaria. So now who, what just, who just showed up? Samaria just showed up. And Samaria becomes the capital of the north, the northern tribe. Verse 25, But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did worse than all that were before him. For he walked all in the, in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and, and in his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God of, of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and his might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Notice you have Samaria being established. And in verse 26, the standard for the king in the, in the northern tribes is this issue of with Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Jeroboam, which he did uh, to provoke the Lord God of Israel, it's, 13 times it's said about Jeroboam that he does that. Now the standard in the southern kingdom Who's in the southern kingdom? David is. David's the standard. Omri becomes the standard. Jeroboam becomes the standard in the north. And what is it? To provoke the Lord to God to anger and cause Israel to sin. Verse 28, So Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. And Ahab, his son, reigned in his stead. And in the thirty and eight year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. Now, Ahab's not a good guy. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria twenty and two years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. See how it's just getting progressively worse? That standard was set by Jeroboam. And it's just getting worse and worse. Verse 31, And it came to pass, as if, uh, um, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel. Now, you know if her name's Jezebel, she ain't good. Okay, you, you, you just know that. But who is she? She's the daughter of who? Ethbaal. Do you see what's in his name? You see Eth, and then you see Baal, don't you? Hmm. Now, who's Ahab? He's the king. He just married in to the uh, Ethbaal, king of the who? You remember the Zidonians from Judges? There they are again. And went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And he made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that went before him. Notice what happens here. Ahab marries Jezebel, whose daddy is Ethbaal. And where is he at? He's down at the house of Baal, worshiping with a bunch of guys who are called priests, who got a vow of poverty, who are all decked out. And they're Jeremiah 44. What are they doing? They're burning incense. They got drink offerings. And they're making cakes to who? the queen of heaven. Now we're going to get to Jeremiah 44 in just a second, but notice what they did. They, they, he makes a grove a, in verse 33. Deuteronomy 16, Moses said, don't make the grove. A grove is a high place of shrines, 
okay, where they would have their, their little shrines to the gods. By the way, also the grove is where a lot of the sexual uh, activity that is associated with Baal worship takes place. That's why you're not to do that. Verse 34, in his days did Hiel the Bethlehemite build what? Who? Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Segum, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. In Joshua 6, verse 26, God said, anybody rebuilds Jericho, it's going to cost them their kids. This man just lost his two boys by building what? By building Jericho, okay, a cursed city. All right? Now, Back up in verse 32, and he reared up a what? An altar. Well, what do you do on an altar? You make sacrifices, don't you? Uh, hold on here and go run over to Jeremiah 44 just real quick so you, you get it back in your mind. Leave, uh, put something in First Kings because we're going to come back. Jeremiah 44. Folks, the, the, I'm going through this because... In Deuteronomy 32, in the song, this is where they're at when the judgment stands or starts. They're into this stuff, okay? Jeremiah 44, you start down there in verse 15, and there may, but in verse 16, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us, in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. <clears throat> but, we certainly, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. To burn what? Incense to who? Oh, there's our, there's our mom again, isn't it? To burn incense to the queen of heaven. To pour out what? There's our cup that she has over there and her symbol, the drink offering. By the way, Psalm 16 tells us those drink offerings are drink offerings of blood. Down in verse <coughs> number 19, And when we had burned incense to the queen of heaven, poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her what? Cakes. So we've got our cakes. So what do they do? They come in, they're burning incense. They've got a drink offering that represents blood, and they've got a cake that represents the body of Christ. And they do a hoodly do yabba-dabba-do, and it transfiguration... <laughs> Transubstantiations, I was going to say transforms, but I was thinking, subs uh, anyway, doesn't matter. It transforms into all this stuff. And they're doing it to the queen of heaven. It's Baal worship. Now come back to 1 Kings 19. Uh, 19. Elijah gets down to the end here, verse 18. And he says, yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the, what? The knees have not, what? So now we got some bowing, right? So what do they do? They got a little bowing going on. Every mouth which have not, what? Kissed him, so now it's kiss the ring. See that? It's all right there. So you got a priest. Who's got a house to find a house of God's a, a house to find God, offering sacrifices, burning incense. He's got a drink offering. He's doing it in a long robes. He's got all the bells and whistles around him, and he's doing it associated. By the way, Jericho is that city. It's not the city in Revelation. It's talking that's Jerusalem. But what is Jericho? It's a cursed city. In Revelation, what is Jerusalem? Cursed. There they are. Now, come, come over to 2 Kings. show you a couple other things here. 2 Kings 17. So, again, when you see this stuff, you shouldn't be shocked. Because it's been going on since Genesis 10. <laughs> Genesis 10 and 11. So if, they, if anybody ever says, well, our religion is the oldest religion, they are right. It is the oldest religion. And you, you, there's no argument there. It's been going on since Genesis 4 with Cain, but really with Nimrod's in Genesis 10 and 11. 
Okay, they are the old, and by the way, we're not just talking about the Roman Catholics. I know everybody thinks Rome, but the Lutherans do the same thing. Some Protestant groups do the same thing. Okay, so we're not, not, we're not talking about just a specific group. We're talking about Baal worship. We're talking about the religious system. 2 Kings 17, look at verse 16. And they left all... Uh, and they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the what? The host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. They worshipped all the who? The host of heaven. In angel worship. Colossians 2, Paul says, they've never seen those. But what are they doing here? Now we bring in the angels, don't we? And I know the board's a mess, but folks, this stuff is a mess. <laughs> Turn over to Isaiah 47. A couple more and we'll be done. I think you get the point. Isaiah 47. And by the way, there are many more verses... You can look at the issue, um, Isaiah 47, you got that? Oh, <clears throat> Well, you can look at the issue of the Star of Moloch. I was looking for it in Acts, I can't find it real quick. Where does that come from? This stuff right here. The star of David that flies, that they say flies on the, on the flag for Israel? Nope, it's the star of Moloch. And I know what people say, oh, no, the star of Moloch's five points and that one's six or five, whatever. It doesn't matter. What are they? Where did it come from? The graven and molten images right there. The, the symbol of Israel is the burning bush, not the star. You know, so you got all of that that comes in. The queen of heaven. Great is Diane of Ephesus. By the way, that's a lady's name, isn't it? Diana of Ephesus, isn't it? Isaiah 47, verse 1. Come down and sit in the dust. Oh, who? Wait a minute now. Who? A virgin. Daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground, there is no throne. O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Verse 5, by the way, well, verse 5. Sit thou silent and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the what? The lady of the kingdoms. You know a church building that's called Our Lady? There we go. Verse 7. And thou saidest, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thine heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. The lady. By the way, this chapter 47 is all judgment of God on Babylon. Here's our judgment. Verse 12. Stand now with thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries. He tells, he tells Israel, don't you mess with divination. Don't you mess with that stuff, raising the dead and talking to dead people. The bewitching. And I think about the, the witch of Endor when, boy, when she called up for Saul, when she called up Solomon, not Solomon, Samuel, and he stood, scared them both probably three quarters of the way to dead, you know, to death. Not supposed to do that. Verse 12 wherein thou hast labored from thy youth, if so be that thou ha shalt be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail. Thou art uh, uh, weirded in the multitudes of thy counsel. Let now the astrologers and the stargavers and the mo monthly procrastinators, there's your um, uh, horoscope, stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. 
They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. Ooh, he's going to get them, isn't he? By the way, verse 13, the stargazers and the astrologers, all that's important stuff to who? To God. He communicated to the earth and the stars. But when they got polluted, he says, no, I'm not going to do that. Write it in a book now. Okay? So when you look at astrology and study that out, it's okay to study that out. Just don't do it in the what? In the worshiping of the host of heaven. You know? I read my horoscope every now and then, and I should be a multimillionaire based upon that stuff. Problem is, is it ain't happened. Okay? The system, that's what we're talking about. Now, one more passage, 2 Corinthians 6. Because that's Israel, and here's the body. Because this stuff starts, and I'm going to put the chart back up here on the wall. This stuff starts back here. And it goes all the way across to, to the great white throne judgment. Actually, it's destroyed and it's dealt with in the second coming. It gets the pagan Gentiles, and then it got into Israel, and it got them. And guess what? It's in with us, too. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And everybody says, oh, that's marriage. No, go read 1 Corinthians 7. That takes care of that. This isn't, and this, by the way, this isn't business either. Romans, he says, be not slothful in business. Folks, if you couldn't do business with unsaved people, you couldn't buy groceries. That's not what, so we're not talking about that. Well, how do you know? Keep reading. For what fellowship hath righteousness with what? So instantly, you know, I mean, right off the bat, you know we're not talking about marriage or business. We're talking about something spiritual here, aren't we? And what commune hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with, oh, there it is, Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Look at that. So even in the body of Christ, Paul talks about the system and the fact that it'll corrupt you if you mess with it. So he says... For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. He, Paul quotes Isaiah 52 in connection with doing what? Don't mess with the system. Don't mess with the religious system. You have no business in it, because what will it do? It'll corrupt you. So when you come back to Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy 32, when you come back here to Deuteronomy 32, we'll start the sixth stanza next time, what, you ha what happens here to is the reason for him saying it's time for judgment is because in verse 31 their rock is not as our rock they've left the true foundation and they've gone over here after this okay that's why we take the road trip a little bit so you see their vine is a vine of Sodom and their field of Gomorrah their grapes are are bitter they're not what they're supposed to be they're their wine is poison of dragon, cruel venom of ass. Why? They're in the wrong system. So now God's going to come along and judge them. Okay? So we'll pick up six stanza next time. All right? Okay.